Hi everyone, welcome to our presentation today. This webinar topic is Replacing Diesel in an Alaskan Community, Cordova's New Battery Energy Storage System. This webinar is a presentation of the DOE-OE Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. And we have a number of excellent guest speakers with us today. Before I pass it over to them, I would like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled, and um, you can also click on that arrow to expand the webinar console. And one thing that I would like to draw your attention to on the webinar console is the questions box. We encourage you to submit your questions and your comments throughout the webinar by typing them in to the questions box and hitting send. We will save some time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A. We do have a lot of people registered, so I expect that we'll have a lot of questions. To make sure that we get to your question, please type it in when you think of it and don't wait until the very end to submit your questions. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a link to the webinar slides and recording um, sometime this afternoon, or at least within about 24 hours. And we'll also be posting all of those materials on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to our host for today's webinar, Val Story. Val is a project director at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and she is going to introduce the topic and um, all of our speakers today. Over to you, Val. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks to all our presenters for their time today, and thanks to all of you for listening. We have a large audience and a lot of great content and a success story to share today. But before we begin, let me briefly introduce CISA. CISA is the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a nonprofit based out of Montpelier, Vermont, and our mission is to help states, particularly state energy offices and associated agencies, advance their clean energy policies and programs. Up on the screen, you can see a snapshot of our current membership. You see that we've got wide, broad national representation. And one of our, we run many programs in renewable energy, one of which is STAP. And Sam, if you'll go back to the previous slide, thanks. STAP is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. And this is a program that we run under contract with Sandia National Labs and with funding from the US Department of Energy's Office of Electricity. And through this program, we provide technical policy and program assistance and program development assistance to states. We help them in their energy storage efforts, and we also bring state and municipal agencies together, again, through funding from DOE and with Sandia. And we um, form partnerships that jointly support energy storage demonstra demonstration projects. And today you're going to hear about one of those, the Cordova Electric Cooperatives Battery Project. Next slide. These projects, as I mentioned, wouldn't be possible without the support and the enthusiasm of two key people, Dr. Imre Zhuk, he's the Director of Energy Storage Research at USDOE, and then Dan Borneo, he's the Engineering Project and Program Lead at Sandia National Labs. Next slide. Thanks. So we have, as Sam mentioned, a variety of speakers today. We're going to kick it off with an introduction by Dr. Imre Zhuk, who's going to talk about the Office of Energy's role in building the business case for energy storage and the office's collaboration with CEC, or the Cordova Electric Cooperation. I'm going to introduce the remainder of the speakers after Dr. Imre Zhuk speaks, but just to give you a taste for what's to come, today we have invited the CEC, the cooperative, to talk about why they invested in a battery energy storage system and the various benefits it's delivering to the co-op. They're going to talk about how, with support from the DOE, they were able to commission Sandia and, the, and ASEP, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, to analyze CEC's operation and to offer solutions that is 
helping the co-op reduce its dependence on diesel. And as you'll learn, the results of the study show that to maintain spinning reserves, CEC was diverting or spilling about 500 kilowatts of water. And as a co-op that prides itself and operates under the principles of sustainability and resilience, when the co-op learned that it could capture more of its renewable hydro and reduce its reliance on diesel, it began exploring alternative solutions. And so in 2019, the CC commissioned a lithium ion battery, and you're gonna learn about this battery solution and the savings it has brought the cooperative to date. So for now, let me turn it over to Dr. Imre Zhuk. Will you, there we go. Well, hello there. Uh, I'm Imre Duk. I direct the energy storage research at the Department of Energy in the Office of Electricity. And our program supports grid scale energy storage. And in particular, for resilience, stability, and a greener grid. So, in order to do this, uh, we do many things, of course. We do basic research, we uh, do analysis, but we also have a good number of actual projects throughout uh, the United States. It's not just a question of putting up projects, but it's a question of building business cases of projects that involve energy storage. The cost and the benefit has to balance. And we have projects in energy storage that link with renewable energy of wind, water, and sun. And here's an example of one of our uh, more successful projects. Uh, you can, it's the uh, microgrid storage project in Sterling. Somebody should mute himself, please. There we are. Uh, this is a project in Sterling, Massachusetts. Uh, in a microgrid storage project. And it's a collaboration with the Sterling Municipal Light Department. Uh, you can see the uh, storage unit here. And the ribbon cutting was in October of 2016 and the commissioning was in December 2016. Took us just three months to put this up. So what does it do? Well, there is something called uh, demand charges. When you get electricity from your supplier, you pay not only for the total amount, but you pay for the peaks, these peaks there. And it takes the biggest of the monthly peaks, and that's what you get charged for. Well, when you have storage, you can throw in your storage at the peak, it reduces the peak, and then your demand charges are much lower. So this worked very well. Uh, there are yearly demand charges and monthly dem demand charges. And this is how it played out. This shows you the amount of savings that the storage uh, produced. You can see that throughout the month, there is a small amount of uh, money that is being saved and then comes in the yearly saving and then it continues again. And going on like this, in a year and a half, uh, we, uh, we reached $1 million in avoided cost. And the project also got somewhat famous 
because visitors from Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, visited there to see how to do a good project. Well, that's Sterling, Massachusetts. And here is Cordova, Alaska, uh, a small town, population 2,239. 2, you can see the town here. Uh, it's a very pretty town because you've got mountains in the back and you have the ocean around you. And here is the town itself and its fishing fleet. And the town uh, is built on ancient Eak lands. And so since the Eaks live there as well as the rest of the population, uh, I should uh, say hello to you in Eak. It's Ishu. Are you there? And this is what the place is really famous for. It's salmon, Copper River salmon is the world's finest salmon, and I can attest to that. It's also famous for its innovative uh, electric system. It's the Cordova Electric Cooperative, and we are co collaborating with them on a new project. Uh, but even without us, they do interesting things. For example, they have put their entire distribution system underground, which is something that many cities would like to do, uh, but here in Cordova, they have done it. The generated, generation of electricity in Cordova mainly comes from this dam, uh, which has about uh, six megawatt, produces about six megawatts of power. Uh, there's some more hydro there as well, and there are two diesel diesels each of one megawatt. Now, as you will hear when uh, Clay and others uh, tell you about the details, uh, half a megawatt of this energy is actually deflected as spinning reserve, which is a shame because the hydro is only six cents per kilowatt and the diesel is 60 cents per kilowatt. That's because this community is entirely isolated and you can only reach it by sea or air. There are no roads. So bringing diesel there is, is expensive. So the solution for this was to build uh, a facility to store energy. And this is a one megawatt, one hour lithium ion storage unit uh, produced by SAFT with the electronics by ABB. And it sits here on ancient Eak land. Uh, we had a marvelous ribbon cutting with Senator Markowski attending. And uh, it was commissioned in on June 7th, 2019. So what does it do? Well, it does potentially a number of things. First of all, it takes care of frequency regulation essentially replacing the diesel and using water power instead uh, through the uh, storage unit. Uh, it can also load follow, uh, making the hydro dispatchable. Uh, it can act as an emergency supply uh, if any glitches happen to the system. Uh, the storage can provide uh, a fair amount of power, uh, at least uh, for mission critical functions. And then there are other things that are still being explored. For example, you can use it to arbitrage the diesels so that you can run the diesels in the most effective way. And a recent one, uh, when you have dormant diesels, you can preheat them uh, electrically uh, rather than uh, using a f uh, fuel again. Now, we have a lot of other projects as well. Uh, for example, we have a project with the Albuquerque school system. Uh, we have a project with the Picuris Pueblo in New Mexico uh, to install storage in combination with solar for energy independence. 
uh, Iowa, we, uh, we are developing six to eight hour backup for existing and planned renewables. We have three projects involving rural co-ops and military reservations. Uh, we have a project in Alaska, way over where the Aleutian Islands are starting in Leavelock Village uh, to provide technical assistance in, in establishing an energy storage microgrid. And we have dreams of a really big project in Puerto Rico uh, for a five town consortium to, uh, to form a central mountain microgrid. And that one will be big. It'll be 250 megawatts solar and hydro. So many applications, many different places, and uh, we are working out the benefit structures and the uh, best procedure to bring about energy storage. So in conclusion, energy storage should be in the toolbox of every utility, just as it is here in Cordova. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhuk. Thanks for providing us with a national overview of the energy, proje energy storage projects you're working on and for setting the stage for this following presentation. So to that end, let me continue with some brief bios before the Cordova team dives into their presentations. And also let me remind folks that we're hosting a Q&A session at the end of all the presentations, but please do, we highly encourage you to type your questions into the question box now, and then I'll be collating them and asking them of all the panelists at the end of all the presentations. So moving on to the Cordova slides, we have three presenters for you from the Cordova Electric, Electric Cooperative. The first speaker will be Scott Newland. He was the manager of the Yakutat, I hope I've pronounced that right, the Yakutat Power for 18 years, and he's now the manager of generation and distribution for CEC. And then following Scott, I believe we're going to be having Clay Coplin speak. Clay is the Chief Executor, Executive Officer at Cordova Electric Cooperative, and he also serves on the Federal Advisory Committee of the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity. And fun side note, he is also the Mayor of Cordova. And then we're following Clay's presentation with Nate Kane. He is CEC's production foreman, and he has 15 years of power production, maintenance, and operation experience. And he has an associate's degree in process technology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So these are your panelists. I will let, Scott, I will let you take it away. You may be on mute. Here we go. We can... Okay, can you hear me there? We've got you, Scott. Let's try this. Is this a little better? That seems to be yes. fine, Scott. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for the introduction. Scott, the audio is cutting out. Um, is there a way you could get closer to the microphone? I'm sorry about that. Can you try? The, is this any better? That's a lot better. Okay, Thanks. very good. Okay, I was starting out going to tell you where Cordova, Alaska is located. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, Emory did a fantastic job of explaining it. I'll try to carry on from there a little bit. Uh, we're located on the coast of Alaska in the center of the Gulf, northern center, 
and it's just south of, or I guess you would say west of Anchorage a little bit down the coast. It's on the west edge of the Prince William Sound. We are isolated from all other communities and accessible by water or air. There's no roads in or out. The community of Cordova is located on the lost coast of South Central Alaska. We are at the northern limit of the coastal boreal rainforest. So it's a very rainy environment here. Cordova has a strong seafood catching and processing industrial base. It ranked it as the 11th largest seafood port in the United States in 2017. The population of 2,300 residents has an annual fisheries economy that approaches 100 million US dollars annually. So that's a little bit of a background of what, what we are as a community and what we are servicing as a utility. Our hydro projects are run of the river projects, so there's no storage behind them per se. The energy supply is highly variable depending upon the seasonal and daily weather fluctuations. The energy demand is also highly variable with fishery seasons and daily catch volumes. This dynamic load and hydro supply makes the grid very expensive and challenging to manage. As some of you are aware, there are many challenges to running an isolated islanded grid. For instance, there is no grid support to fall back on when we have any issues. If the power goes off, it's off until we make repairs. We don't have any incoming power to fall back on. So as we look at this slide, you can see our generation assets. Our smaller run of the river hydro project is Humpback Creek. And this is a photo of the intake of it. And it's located approximately seven miles north of the community, up Orca Inlet. Our other hydro project is located on the other side of a hill or a mountain, and it's called Power Creek Hydro Project. It has a little over six megawatts for a project uh, generation capacity. And that's the bread and butter of our system. So that's where most of our generation comes from. When we can produce it from the, the flow of the river that comes through there. And then we have towards the center of town, it's a little bit outside of the town still proper. And it's right in this area. That's where we have our diesel plant. At our Orca diesel plant, we have 10.8 megawatts of diesel. That should carry our peak load when we need it if something happens to all of our hydro projects. We're constantly trying to bridge this together. And with the addition of our battery energy storage system, the BESS, it makes it a lot more lucrative to do that. So like was mentioned before, we have 100% underground distribution system, which is pretty unique and it's a fantastic environment to live in. Just the aesthetics of it alone are breathtaking in this kind of an environment. As we get back to our hydro project, we spill three to four gigawatts hours of hydro per year. So there's times when our rivers run more than we can produce with or our loads will handle. This happens during the peak demands and usually on the shoulder seasons before the processing and after the processing. We supplement our hydro with our diesel when we don't have enough capacity to cover the whole processing load. 
we try to gauge our hydro production sometimes on a percentage of hydro. So as we look at our hydro, it's really hard to disseminate because sometimes a bad fishing season, we don't need as much load. Less demand makes the percentage go up, but we always strive for 70% and above on hydro. One of our goals is to displace as much diesel as possible. I said before, we don't have any storage behind our hydro. Well, that's not completely true. We do have a form of storage. And in the mountains, it's snow, snowpack from the, the winter snow season. So if we have a big snow year, we have more storage. And our large Power Creek hydro plant is also backed by glacier runoff. So one of the phenomena we saw was when we had a hot summer, we had more glacier runoff than we were really expecting. Which is bittersweet because we know that that's taking our storage away faster than we really want it to. So with that said, we do have plenty of rain here, as was mentioned before. But sometimes too much rain is just as bad as not enough for us because when we start getting floods and high water and it starts affecting our intakes on our hydro projects, sometimes we have to shut them down. Sometimes a lot of debris comes down the river with it and we have to drop our inflatable dam, let things pass through. So that's always an issue when we have too much rain. Floods will cause issues for us. And we have to use diesel when those events happen. We're always researching more opportunities for more hydro, et cetera. Hydro and renewables, anything to replace the diesel that we use. We're constantly striving to improve the system and lower our diesel consumption. The slide that's up right now shows the uh, average load for a year, and it represents some pretty interesting things, 2012 actually. Like was mentioned before, when we run, before we had the best system, we would run our hydros with a spinning reserve of 500 kilowatts, sometimes up to 750 kilowatts of excess water. So we would have to divert that much water in order to pick up the load swings from our processing plants and et cetera. With our big load swings, we had to have that much reserve, spinning reserve to catch the system. So that's represented in the yellow or the orange band there. You can see how often that is during our peak season. And then we had to pick it up with diesel and you can see the diesels coming off and on with the black underneath which is a little bit disheartening because we have plenty of hydro to generate everything we can. We just don't have the capacity to do that with that spinning reserve in place. So from that scheme, we are always striving to displace that diesel use as much as possible. Diesel is very expensive, like was mentioned, 60 cents a kilowatt hour versus six cents for hydro. So we've done quite a few of other, other things to try to displace our diesel use and take full advantage of our hydro use. We look at all kinds of different technologies to utilize all the hydro that we can and displace all of the diesel that we can when we can. So we're constantly striving for that, looking at feasibilities and other sources of generation. So there's a lot of things we have going on here. And as we do this, we still have to take care of our daily operations and maintenance. There's a lot of equipment out there, a lot of different assets and a small staff to do that. So it's very challenging, but it's also very rewarding. And with that, I think I'll pass it on to Clay to follow up on the next portion of this project or of our presentation and 
Clay is the CEO of Cordova Electric Cooperative. And he will take it from here and try to explain some of the philosophy behind the best and some of our other renewables we're looking at. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, here we have just another glimpse of um, our Power Creek intake with water going to waste there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the progression of how the battery energy storage system came to be on the Alaska grid. So the Department of Energy has recognized that grid modernization and uh, new technologies and the new grid architecture where people and businesses are self-generating and we have the advent of more uh, renewables that are more intermittent, such as wind and solar, that's creating all kinds of new challenges uh, for the grids of every size. And those challenges uh, are not going to be solved by any one individual, any one technology, or any one organization. And hence, the uh, advance of the grid modernization uh, consortium projects. But um, around a specific technology, uh, Dr. Juke has developed a, uh, a skunk works around this battery energy storage system for Cordova. And you can see there are a lot of partners listed here including uh, our host and advocates, Clean Energy States Alliance. There's just a bit of a lag here, but uh, so we, I'm going to show you a timeline here in a minute that explains the, the full timelines, but we ultimately settled on a battery energy storage package after looking at several storage technologies. Um, and Dr. Juke mentioned that um, every grid should have energy storage in its toolbox. Um, what we have learned and continue to learn about battery energy storage is that it is its own toolbox and it has all kinds of different tools available. And some of those tools, as you can see in our system, you can use uh, simultaneously to solve different problems. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the aspects of our technical teams, uh, but Cordova Electric, as Dr. Juke mentioned, uh, has quite a bit of technical resources of our own, uh, not the least of which is Scott Newland, who managed his own microgrid in Yakutat for years, and, and Nate Kane, who um, in a small utility environment where we do everything locally, from publishing our own paperwork and doing our own billing and the automation and operation and maintenance and construction of our whole system, uh, we get to be generalists that get to be fairly good at a lot of different disciplines. And, and you develop uh, unique skill sets and creative approaches. Uh, and that is Nate Kane and, and many of our employees here. So one aspect of this project I'm proud of is, is the incredible timelines that we were able to follow, um, partly because of the help and resources, uh, largely I should say, of our technical team and project champion with uh, Dr. Juke. So we had uh, a, a brownfield site on May 1st of 2019, uh, literally no site work had been done. This is a vacant lot. And you see that uh, here by May and June, we're driving pilings, we're installing conduits. Uh, the batteries arrived in uh, May. They were sitting on containers in mid-May. And by mid-June, we had those all connected, uh, the conduits all run. Uh, we had the project uh, energized by July. But um, in June, when we had all the equipment on site and heated up, uh, we celebrated the success uh, to that point of the commissioning and specification and installation of this battery energy storage system. And we like to celebrate successes with fresh seafood and good friends and partners. And that was this event. So to give you a little insight into the timelines, uh, the, the real big events and heavy lifting of the CEC team, our technical partners, electric power systems, uh, ABB on the inverter side, and SAFT on the battery energy storage side, um, uh, kind of uh, made the major milestone of actually energizing the equipment. And we went into manual operations uh, as of July of last year. So to give you a bigger picture of the timelines, we recognize once our system peaks and our, our growing seafood industry 
which was largely due to the lower cost hydro and stable rates that we made available to them, which really came to roost in 2007, 2008 with the economic crisis and the, and the high spike in fuel costs. Um, a lot of offshore seafood processing and diesel-based processing moved onshore. Tens of millions of dollars of seafood plant investments grew the capacity and the demand on the CEC renewable system. And our four megawatt peak jumped to a nine megawatt peak in two or three short years. And fortunately, we had seven megawatts of hydro, but it pushed us into a situation where we had no more spinning reserve. We had to start supplementing with diesel. And we realized we had a new problem that we called the Valley of Death, that we switched back and forth between diesel and hydro. We were wasting hundreds of kilowatts of hydro capacity. So as we grew a partnership with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, and they recognized that we stored one second resolution data in our whole system, and that we had a highly automated system, they realized that the Department of Energy had the technical resources and expertise to help marry us to an energy storage technology that could solve our problem and improve the economics and environmental performance of our microgrid. So they approached Dr. Zhuk in 2015, 2016. He looked at uh, Cordova and Cordova Electric and the data and realized it was a great opportunity to um, look at energy storage in general select and right size and right located technology to get the best economic and technical performance and just as importantly measure that performance against um, advertised lives and advertised performance and really drill into these new technologies. So Sandia National Labs performed that analysis along with Alaska Center for Energy and Power and they did right size and indicate a lithium ion technology for us. And phase two of that project was working with Sandia National Labs. We pulled in the additional partner of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association to help disseminate this data on the back end to almost a thousand electric cooperatives across the country and around the world. And also take advantage of using their procurement template and then sharing our procurement template back to them for future use. So we specified and did order a battery energy storage system from SAFT and ABB in 2018. And we selected those technologies because they've both been in business for 100 years. We knew that they had the technical resources to push their technology from arbitrage and less technically robust solutions to a complex challenge like managing a whole microgrid spinning reserve plus arbitrage plus emergency energy storage, plus many of those blades and the Swiss Army knife that can bring value not only to a remote microgrid in Alaska, but to every grid in the world, really. So I mentioned these timelines, May on-site, June installation, July commissioning and operation. Then we operated the system manually for several months until we got into the really exciting phase where with electric power systems, and constant support and engagement with Sandia Labs and, uh, and a little later in the process, Pacific Northwest National Labs, we went into fully automated operation. We saw a storm, rainstorm coming. Uh, we realized we had an opportunity and Nate pulled the trigger and put, put the best in fully operational mode. And we achieved some amazing savings that Nate's gonna talk about. Later, uh, we crushed all previous records. We said we're 94% hydro in a month that we're usually 50 or 60% hydro in November, 86% hydro in December when we're generally 30% hydro. And then uh, with a very cold, dry winter, uh, the best was largely out of operation until April. But then uh, just two short weeks ago, we were able to go 100% hydro a full three weeks earlier than normal. And we also, during that time frame, commissioned a brand new electric boiler that we could use some of that new excess hydro that we had available to keep our diesel engines very warm and hot and ready to meet our emergency peaking demands or emergency demands if the hydro should fail. And so we are saving uh, diesel fuel in addition 
to our grid savings with the electric boiler. And as of right this minute, as we talk, we were not only 100% hydro, but all five elements of our 300 kilowatt diesel boiler are keeping our diesels hot and saving an additional 10 to 15,000 gallons of diesel fuel every summer. So as we mentioned, a great success story. And with that, I'm gonna pass to uh, Nate Kane, and he's gonna explain some of the fun operational aspects of the project. I should introduce Nate uh, by way of saying that um, he again is a, a generalist, a, a Renaissance guy who can uh, be the crew foreman and line out all the individual tasks for the line crew and the power production crew on site, everything from learning the battery diagnostics, the inverter diagnostics and operations with his left hand while he's actually running control wires and ringing out uh, inputs and outputs with his right hand uh, and managing several crew at once. So um, a pretty amazing skill to have in Cordova and a great uh, part of a great project team. And if I haven't embarrassed you enough, Nate, I'll let you take over now and tell us about the operations. Uh, thank you, Clay. Uh, yeah, we're all sitting in the same room and uh, he's looking at me. So. Just a little embarrassed, but uh, I'll take it. That's fine. Braze is good. Uh, I was wondering, Samantha, if I could get control. I'm going to need to uh, use uh, my mouse to uh, point at a few things. Um, so uh, as Clay mentioned and Scott before me and Dr. Yuke before me, we have a pretty cool battery here on uh, uh, on CEC system. I, I really have enjoyed uh, building it really have enjoyed um, operating it and uh, really have enjoyed uh, using it as a, a pretty cool tool for everything. Uh, it is a Swiss Army knife. The main blade is what we'll talk about today. Uh, we have designed it specifically to, um, uh, we've designed the control system, I will say, uh, specifically to um, target this valley of death that we've been talking about. So I will uh, explain, this is a screenshot of our um, control system, our SCADA system, and I'll explain it from this bottom level minus two, which would be 100% hydro with no need for battery or diesel operations, all the way up to uh, this level, uh, a positive one, which would be um, not enough hydro and uh, diesel online. Uh, this also has our uh, brand new electric boiler over here in the corner. I'll touch on that just a little bit. But uh, main focus will be uh, how we operate this battery. So uh, as we are right now on CEC system, we're down here in level minus two. Uh, that would be we have uh, lots of excess water. Our battery is uh, state of charge on our battery. And this uh, center line here is up at 80 percent or between 75 and 80 uh, percent. And our electric boiler is online and uh, operating to keep our um, diesels warm. Uh, in the situation where the hydro is decreasing, uh, as that uh, comes down, we will, uh, our water level at Power Creek will decrease until we uh, hit a certain set point. It will switch us from level minus two to level minus one, which <clears throat> uh, the really the only thing there is um, that we switch off of our electric boiler because we don't need it anymore. Once the electric boiler has switched off and we drop down into, uh, and the hydro continues to decrease and our water level continues to go down, we will drop down into level zero. And that's the cool part. That's when, uh, this is, this is where we would have started a diesel engine before to supplement our load because we don't have enough hydro, but now we can switch on our uh, brand new battery, put it in isochronous mode and uh, use that extra spinning reserve uh, that is on the hydro to uh, charge and discharge that battery um, instead of starting a diesel. Uh, as the hydro continues to decrease, naturally um, we will use more and more of the, uh, we will output more and more uh, uh, energy from the battery. So our state of charge will de uh, continue to, to decline. Um, 
And as we drop down here to, uh, if the hydro continues to decrease, we will decline all the way down to a 30% uh, state of charge on the battery. And that is when uh, we've basically exhausted our hydro resource and our battery resource, and then we'll start a diesel. Um, once we start a diesel, uh, that is usually either right at the peak time or uh, when uh, at the end of a storm, uh, when the water level drops off, uh, it almost always turns around. So as the hydro increases and our load on the diesel, um, or excuse me, would start the diesel and it will be running and actually charging the battery because we, uh, we have a minimum kilowatt uh, set point that we have to maintain on our diesels. Uh, so say in this uh, situation that we were decreasing um, and using 200 kilowatts of the battery and uh, uh, discharging it at a, a 200 kilowatt rate, we get down here to 30% state of charge uh, and we start a diesel, our diesels have to run at a minimum of 500 kilowatts. So you'll start a diesel, bus it at 500 kilowatts. Now we are serving uh, that 250 kilowatts that the battery was, plus we have an excess 250, and we'll start back up this scale. We will run up the scale. The state of charge uh, will continue up until 65%, um, and then we'll switch the diesel back off, um, and we'll go into level zero. And we will seesaw back and forth uh, there, and that is basically right when we're on the edge season, and that's where we save the most uh, uh, that is the valley of death uh, because we have almost enough hydro to do everything and we don't need to start 500 kilowatts worth of diesel. Um, so we are using exactly the right amount of diesel instead of wasting um, between 250 and 750 uh, kilowatts. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide. Uh, and. Oh, I, I suppose I have control of talk for Clay to move on to the next slide. That's ridiculous. <laughs> this is the uh, November operations that Clay was talking about. And this is um, this is the, our landmark when we uh, uh, started, uh, decided to put it in uh, full operation, full automatic operation. So you can see um, this is a trend of uh, all of the pertinent um, statistics on the battery, I'll go through them. Um, we have our head level, Power Creek head level. This is our water resource up here at the top in uh, gray. We have the red line here. This would be the battery state of charge. Uh, and then there's a couple uh, limits here. I'll explain these later. Uh, and then we have the, in blue, we have the kilowatt output, the actual kilowatt output of the battery. But then down here at the bottom, this is the diesel <clears throat> uh, in green, the diesel output. And it's our specific generator number five, but this is the one that was on uh, over Thanksgiving. So as we uh, come off of hydro, this would be uh, uh, the same example that I gave uh, earlier. This would be a hydro decreasing. So you can see our uh, head level uh, water resources dropping down at Power Creek. We get down to a certain set point and our diesel starts. This is how we uh, used to operate our system. So this was uh, about seven in the morning and uh, I watched it till about noon and decided, well, uh, we are confident enough in our automation and confident enough in uh, done enough testing. So I uh, turned the battery into auto right here. And this is right around um, 1130. As you can see, when we went into auto, uh, the battery started outputting kilowatts. It started dropping in state of charge because we shut the diesel off. Uh, so we were running right here. Um, you can see the scale over on the side. We were running right about 500 kilowatts of diesel um, and we had almost that much in hydro. So when we switched off, notice we were running 500 kilowatts of diesel. We uh, switched the battery into ISOC and used all of the excess hydro and we were only using maybe 100 kilowatts or 50 kilowatts off the battery. So that's a, a good example of uh, using our full water resource. Uh, over the course of that day, this is uh, this time scale here is about about two days, about 48 hours, one day and 22 hours. 
over the course of that day, our water re resource declined, and you can see that the uh, battery responded to that and continued and started outputting more and more kilowatt uh, resource, and the state of charge dropped down. We didn't get all the way down to our minimum state of charge, which is the uh, let me hide the control panel here. Minimum state of charge would be this uh, red line down at the bottom, and this would be our this is our maximum state of charge, and this is the state of charge that we are controlling off of in level one to zero. We drop down. This would be a good example of a peak load. So this would be over the afternoon. Uh, drop the uh, state of charge down to about 50 or 60 percent, and then this is a good example of the evening load swing. Uh, our load came down, which means we have more resource to charge the battery. The battery charged back up to um, 80%, which is uh, 75%, which is when we switch back down to minus two. Um, and it ran there all night. And then in the morning, obviously, on our big loads, on our uh, morning pickup load, you can see uh, this would be a morning load ramp and dropped our battery state of charge down to our diesel start set point. We started a diesel, which in turn took the battery from discharging at about 200 kW to charging at about 200 kW. We ran the diesel at 500 kilowatts for as long as it took to charge our battery up to um, our uh, step down set point. And we stepped back down to step zero and we cycled like that for, this is about uh, a half a day the afternoon and then um, on the load ramp down in the evening obviously the battery uh, uh, kilowatt output went down and then uh, started going into the negative which is is charging and it, it ramped back up to its normal um, 80 percent and then we started right about this time it started raining again and you can see as uh, over the course of the night and into the morning we actually caught uh, back to the point where we had excess water and we went full hydro and we turned the battery completely off and the hydro and the diesel completely off. And this was about the next morning. So over this course of uh, time, uh, I, I looked at it and uh, we had most likely right about uh, 43, 44 hours right here where we would have started this diesel right here and we would have run this diesel all the way to right here. As it was of that 43 hours, uh, the first time we put the battery into auto, um, really for a test, uh, we dropped our 43 hours of diesel runtime to about nine hours. Uh, that's a significant savings, that's an order of magnitude. Uh, so it's a pretty cool project and it, uh, and it worked really well. This was the first time that we uh, put it into automatic mode and um, and it did. Uh, I, I think we've corrected one or two small things in, in this time period, but uh, uh, we left it in auto after this for the most part. So um, that is our operations over the course of Thanksgiving. And I'm sure that these two slides, there will be um, a fair amount of questions on. It's a, it's a very technical uh, thing that we've done here and it's a very uh, complex um, control algorithm and and program that um, myself, Clay, Scott, uh, Trevor Kudna from Electric Power Systems uh, with the assistance of Sandia and uh, uh, all backed by uh, Dr. Zhuk there. Um, we It took a lot of us to uh, come up with this and um, a lot of time basically sitting and talking through how um, we are going to match this battery with our, our hydro resource. Um, so I'm sure that will generate some questions and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, at this point, uh, I think Clay asked me to go through this one. Um, the, uh, this would be our current. Um, uh, this is a, a slide of our current uh, kilowatt hour metering off the battery and then also our battery savings. So basically what I did, uh, uh, after we had it running and uh, kind of into the uh, end of the year, I uh, asked our programmer to basically put a timer on the uh, when we were in step zero 
and uh, step minus one, um, because that is a, uh, that is the representation of when we are in the valley of death and when the battery is actually saving us the money. So this is um, this is year to date of 2020. Uh, we got 105 hours in there already uh, year to date, and um, uh, this is what I was saying earlier. The, the the measures are complex because the control is complex. Um, we indicate that uh, our our fuel savings is only about a half of uh, only about a half of the savings that we get from uh, the di displacing our diesel uh, runtime and maintenance costs is is about fifty percent of the costs of of running a diesel. Um, we have uh, estimated, and it's a it's a fairly uh, now we took some time to do it. Um, our our best estimate, and it's a it's a it's a pretty good one, is uh, five hundred dollars per hour um, when we're when we're uh, in the valley of death. So this number right here, uh, basically, core, this is in hours, and uh, we estimate we're saving about five hundred dollars an hour. So just this year in twenty twenty, like Clay says, only about two or three weeks. Um, our estimate is about fifty two thousand dollars of savings. Um, over the course of that uh, November one, I think we were right in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range, um, and that does not include the uh, boiler fuel fuel savings. That boiler fuel savings is new enough to where I, <laughs> I have not uh, thought through and uh, got the uh, uh, got it calculated into this yet. So um, it's substantial. It's a it's a very good amount of savings. Again, this will have some. Uh, you, I'm sure. You, People will have some questions on this. Uh, our kilowatt hour, uh, or excuse me, our battery efficiency, we can calculate that by uh, battery kilowatts in and battery kilowatts out. Uh, we're at 17, excuse me, that's month to date. The year to date, we're at 30% uh, efficient. SAFT and the battery manufacturers advertise a quite, quite a substantial <laughs> higher efficiency than that. Uh, the reason for this is uh, over the course of winter, like Clay says, we, the battery is off, so we um, it naturally discharges. There's a little bit of parasitic load. So over the course of the winter, um, we inject, uh, we trickle charge it basically, and that skews this uh, um, efficiency number uh, quite a bit. I expect this to go up over the year uh, uh, as we use it more in its traditional manner. Uh, anything I missed that you would like me to cover, Clay? Oh no, that's good, Nate. We'll uh, we'll allow some of this to come up during our uh, discussions. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there will be uh, uh, questions for me, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to answer all of those uh, in in the discussions. Uh, we can go back to these slides, but uh, to to wrap it up, uh, wrap up my part of it. Uh, this Swiss Army knife, as Clay calls it, um, I think we've sharpened the main blade on it really well. Uh, we have. Uh, it's it's doing its job. Uh, we we stuck it into a very specific spot in our system and programmed it to do um, a very specific job, and it's doing it really well. And uh, now it's uh, it's time for us to look forward and um, start looking at moving uh, hydro kilowatt hours from the night into the daytime, and also doing uh, diesel uh, peak shaving and uh, emergency bag uh, UPS mode for like the hospital and 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 those. Uh, um, uh, now I guess it would be time for us to get out the toothpick and the scissors on our Swiss Army knife and uh, sharpen those up. So I think that's what lies ahead of us. Uh, but for for right now, in in the main blade on this uh, on this saft Swiss Army knife is very sharp and it's working well. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Clay, um, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Nate. So I think I've got control here. Um, these are really texty. I wanted to leave some of these slides as a resource uh, for uh, folks to come back and review later. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of our financials to date are more qualitative than quantitative, uh, but there's some high-level uh, successes we can share. Uh, when I took to the board of directors, um, a uh, best case outcome, worst case scenario, and the likely scenario. Uh, our likely scenario, based on some real uh, tight um, 
review of our modeling with 35,000 gallons of fuel savings. Uh, I'm fairly confident that, especially with the boiler fuel savings of 10 to 15,000 uh, gallons, we're trending closer to 70,000 gallons of, of savings. And at uh, the end of our first full operating year, uh, this year, 2020, uh, we'll have captured a, a better picture of that. Battery life is real critical. It's a, a question on many utilities and potential owners' minds. Um, 10 years is kind of advertised uh, because there is calendar aging and degradations. But because of our use case where we're doing very shallow discharges and can do a lot of those and ultimately achieve 100 times of the gross kilowatt hour savings and delivery uh, through our battery energy storage system, uh, we anticipate as much as a 30 year life because where 90% um, estimated savings comes from our spinning reserve function, uh, we only really at the end of the need, end of the day need 10 to 20 kilowatt hours of balancing to pick up our larger loads and let our other equipment respond. And that means that those shallow cycles, this battery can degrade to where it's a very small fraction of its initial installed kilowatt hour capacity and, and still provide the spinning reserve. So it's, it's a real interesting and high value use case. Uh, as Nate mentioned, we discovered that you have to rebuild diesels every so many hours and uh, you have to make emergency and planned replacements of filters. You have to burn lube oil. Um, all of those individual costs add up in your operational hours. And what we found is that at $3 an hour diesel fuel cost, uh, our operating costs, non-fuel costs, were uh, just as high as the diesel fuel costs. And so our data capture and analysis has been uh, a little challenging. Um, we recognized and worked through some technical barriers and equipment limitations on the communications and data collection uh, stock equipment that came with the inverter and the battery banks. And again, ABB and SAFT, great technical partners, have helped us work through the issues and learn things about microgrids and learn things about their own equipment uh, as we learned with them. And we uh, identified the hardware fixes. Unfortunately, uh, despite having that equipment on hand and ready to install, it's going to require a site visit to finish uh, that data capture so we can hand off to Sandia and KNNL and really start getting the good quantitative measures of operational and financial performance. And uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs is, is currently working with our Alaska Center for Energy and Power on some of the extended value streams like emergency backup generation, some of the regulatory barriers there, um, and some of the other use cases, refinements and optimizations and as we look to the future at our actual grid stability and our um, load sharing between our different units, we think we are starting to see a case where 24-7 operation of battery can yield some power quality and response system response benefits. Uh, so we're very eagerly digesting, observing and digesting uh, micro PMU, real high resolution data on our grid dynamics and this is one of the advantages of the CEC grid. What we used to uh, look at with a stethoscope in terms of system dynamics, we now are looking at with an EKG, and I'm confident that we'll learn new and valuable use cases for the battery as we learn more about how our systems operate. So just a high level um, funding and technical partners, uh, CEC, Sandia Labs, and PNNL Labs, thanks to uh, Dr. Juke and Department of Energy storage sponsorship, are pretty much equal partners in the uh, technical uh, uh, cost on Sandia and PNNL side, working with CEC and our technical partners and the lab staff to work through technical barriers and identify and, and enable value streams, and then the hardware uh, side for CEC. And the technical partners, and I want to emphasize, there's a lot of embedded technical expertise uh, even though uh, Dr. Juke is, um, is a department uh, manager, he also brings knowledge and technical skills of his own to the table, as do the CEC staff, as we mentioned. Uh, of course, we expect that of the National Laboratory staff, 
uh, and even some of the leadership team there, Dan Borneo and others, that uh, we all have our different perspectives. And from CEC's hands-on street smarts right up to the high technology of the labs, and then our local Alaska Center for Energy and Power, and then our National Rural Electric Cooperative. So that team's great. And then, of course, we thank CESA for the advocacy and for webinars and opportunities like this to share this technology and transfer it to other valuable use cases. So we learned a lot of things about battery energy storage. And as a distribution engineer, I learned that I had to understand new language. Capacity in an electric system is KW peak demand capacity. In energy storage, it's kilowatt hour capacity. And these batteries lose capacity every year from calendar aging uh, SAFT is hopeful that uh, our particular chemistry will have a reduced uh, aging uh, from calendar, just, just uh, age. And then, uh, as I mentioned, capacity loss is in kilowatt hours. It's not in KW peak. Um, fortunately, you maintain most of your DC efficiency over battery life. Uh, these are all things that we'll be able to measure and uh, verify as we get access to and, and uh, analyze the uh, data in our battery. So as I mentioned, deep cycling causes rapid loss of life, uh, whereas shallow cycling uh, can uh, increase the throughput to tens of millions of cycles rather than thousands. When you do the math, that means you can get up to 500 gigawatt hours of total throughput uh, in a system balancing case instead of five gigawatt hours in a purely arbitrage. However, as Jim McDowell of SAF said, why would you leave the arbitrage savings off the table uh, when you can have both? And in our case, we get to do both simultaneously. As Nate mentioned, we are actually discharging the battery while it's balancing system loads. So we get to use more than one blade of that Swiss Army knife at the same time. So uh, big question for a lot of utilities. We estimate that 60% of our uh, initial package cost of hardware uh, will be required to replace and recycle, but recognize that the chemistries and the technology is improving. It's a modular system. We can change it out a cell at a time uh, as we choose, or in our case, just actually let it degrade and still appreciate the primary uh, grid balancing value from it. And then we found that delivery times were, as I mentioned, we ordered in October and we had it on the ground in Cordova, uh, shipped by uh, trains, planes, and automobiles, and boats to, to Cordova uh, by May. Uh, factory warranties are very risky, both for the vendor, because it depends on how the customer uses it, and for the customer who's relying on the safety and performance from the manufacturer. So it's something that has to be approached uh, carefully, and, uh, and, and we did, and we structured it so that um, the maintenance and warranty uh, are somewhat optional going forward, and we've split the maintenance so that our staff are trained to do the, the semi-annual and the factory staff in come in to do the annual, and that was a good way to uh, kind of share costs and risks and skills. The key takeaways, control algorithms, uh, integrating into a microgrid, very complex. It's why we uh, iterated from manual operations and learning the system as Nate uh, suggested, right up through fully automated. It's a process and not an event. Um, we have recognized considerable improvements in use case and optimization just in the limited operation that we've had in the last few months. And uh, we do expect to continue to identify new valuable uh, value streams. Uh, as we carefully monitor and evaluate the data and and apply successive uh, optimizations in the future. And I mentioned already that we are smashing hydro records in the winter, and now we're starting our hydro season earlier, and also appreciating the better, uh, the uh, boiler savings. And uh, that's a wrap for us, and we'd be glad to turn it back over to our host and entertain questions. Thank you very much for uh, participating. Great, thanks so much Clay and everyone for the presentations. We can now move into the Q&A, but 
before we do that, let me echo actually a lot of the comments that came in. Um, congratulations, job well done. It's very exciting to hear about this project and to hear about your plans moving forward. So thank you for sharing what you've learned so far. All right. It seems like the other burning question, or moving on to the first burning question folks had, everyone must be coming off of a long, cold winter, is what about the batteries in the winter? How do they handle the cold? And is there anything you need to do about it? Well, that's a good question. And I'm gonna look at an adjacent technology uh, because we've learned something here in coastal Alaska, I think. And, and realize that we're in a very uh, temperate zone. We sit right on the Pacific Ocean. Our uh, climate here in Cordova is probably actually closer to Seattle's climate than Anchorage's. Uh, it's uncommon for us to drop below 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Very uncommon for us to rise above 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the uh, summer. And so what they learned in Juneau with the Nissan Leaf electric vehicles is that uh, we are what is called the Goldilocks climate for lithium ion uh, technologies. We're not too hot and we're not too cold. And they have Nissan Leafs uh, on the road in Juneau that have over 70,000 miles on them and still have all 12 bars of battery life. So battery life is going to be an interesting one to watch in our application. And, and we think uh, we might uh, learn some uh, very welcome surprises about battery life in our climate. Thank you. Sounds like a terrific place to visit. <laughs> All right, so um, let's move on. I failed to mention that joining us for the Q&A portion of this webinar, we have Dan Borneo from Sandia on the line, so he's available to answer questions as well. And we also have Todd Alinsky, Paul, Project Director at CISO, working on energy storage on the line as well. Let me put out... Um, Actually, a question for both the teams, both the DOE Sandia team and then the Cordova team. What other technology solutions were considered in the ASEP Sandia analysis? And then for you, Cordova, what uh, storage systems did you consider? Okay, we were just um, kind of comparing notes. Um, I was involved uh, early on in, in the procurement part of this, so I can probably field this one, uh, Ms. Clay. Uh, we looked at um, we looked at some of the other Alaska projects, like over in Kodiak, where they have a flywheel uh, technology. We looked at ultra capacitors. Um, we looked at several competing technologies, even something as simple as uh, repurposing a diesel as a synchronous condenser. Um, and uh, so we looked at a fair range uh, from high technology, uh, higher risk to low technology, low risk. But what we found at the end of the day is that uh, why would you couple a flywheel uh, and uh, you know a short-term energy with a longer term when the battery can do both? The great thing about battery energy storage technology and an inverter and their flexibility is that they can uh, do the very fast-acting uh, grid balancing type um, time scale down into sub second, even sub cycle responses, uh, all the way up into hours of, of uh, storage for arbitrage and other uses. So we found that the battery was more flexible. The technology had evolved and was commercial grade, uh, stable enough and comfortable enough for a remote location where O&M can be challenging. So that's uh, primarily flywheels super caps, and uh, even some pump storage and other technologies, but the battery energy storage was uh, the best uh, short-term payout, and um, it fit well within our future plans, and it complements some of the other opportunities. We saw it as complementary to hydro if we de develop more. It's very complementary to solar and wind, so as we uh, fit it into our whole portfolio, uh, it was a good fit now and in the future. Okay, great. All right, let's dive into some of the details. We've had a couple of questions about battery life and also the state of charge, why that's between 30 to 70 percent and not all the way up to 100 percent. 
I'll take that. Uh, this is Nate. Um, we, uh, Jim Mc, uh, Clay mentioned Jim McDowell's name uh, from SAFT. Uh, there was long conversations and uh, substantial uh, modeling that was done. And uh, that is the 30 to 70% is the um, most that, that has to do with uh, life of the battery. Uh, that is the easiest on the uh, lithium ion cells. And also, um, our 30 to 70 percent um, gives us a buffer zone, a dead band on either side. So either we can overshoot or we can um, we can undershoot. We can get into some situations where we have reserve. Basically, uh, I you, if you're at 100 percent capacity and you need to charge the battery some more, um, well, you you can't. And if you're at zero uh, percent, uh, the the bottom is is um, the the part where it actually hurts the battery pretty bad. Uh, they don't they don't recommend char uh, discharging to zero percent state of charge, um, really on any lithium ion system. Uh, so I, the 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 critical zone is ten percent, uh, and the the happy zone is thirty to eighty. Um, uh, I do believe they said uh, we could go twenty to ninety, so we cut ours down just a little bit more in hopes to. Uh, um, save battery life and be well within the green zone and also we could we we were able to design our whole control system around that and uh it worked out really well for us so um there is no more capacity there and there is more length of time that we could charge and discharge uh but for us uh for safety measures and to give us a little bit of reserve and to treat the battery as good as we can um we chose our 30 to 80. Terrific, thank you. Um, so staying with battery charging, we have a question here. What is the capacity of your diesel generator or de generators and is it run at peak efficiency when you're charging the battery or is it just enough to um, meet the load? Uh, yeah, I'll take that as well. It says Nate. Um, the the we use our smallest diesel generator to come on first after hydro which would be a one megawatt uh, 3516 uh an a series cat actually it's an old machine um it's all mechanical and uh we recently uh just before we put the uh battery in we put some high quality fuel uh high resolution fuel meters on um, all of our diesel units uh, and actually, we learned something that the uh, fuel curve, most everybody, uh, the, the conventional thought is a fuel curve on a diesel looks like a hockey stick. You get up to about 80 percent and it's it's uh, the most efficient there. And it's pretty low efficiency from uh, from zero to about 60. Um, we found with that uh, 3516 specifically, um, we were very we're almost as efficient at 50 percent as we are at 80 percent. So they've got a really wide band. Um, so same same thought, you know, we're on a microgrid and we like to treat our things as nicely as we can and keep them running for as long as we can. So right at 50% uh, is 500 kilowatts for that, uh, that machine. And um, it is almost as efficient, I would say within <clears throat> one or 2% efficient of uh, being uh, at 500 kilowatts at 50% load as it is at 80% load. So um, uh, specifically to answer your question, we run our diesel, uh, the first one that comes on at 50% load, and that is uh, almost as efficient as it can be. Okay, thank you. In one of your earlier slides, you showed that um, hydro is contributing from 84 to 100 percent and you had a couple of jumps from 86 to 94 percent to 100 percent what contributed to that transition okay i'm, I'm backing up to uh the slide there so that's the last three bullets there so that 80 uh, the 94% was for the entire month of November. So we were 94% hydro that month. It was a combination of having the battery running in, in uh, grid balancing. So we didn't have to run diesels hardly at all that whole time because we were delivering the, the full hydro capacity that was available. 
we also had a fairly warm, wet December. Uh, same thing, we were able to deliver every single kilowatt hour of hydro to the grid uh, without wasting any diesel. So um, we delivered an extra five to 750 kW of hydropower and at the same time minimized the diesel use to only what was needed to charge the battery or displace the hydro. So that combination of better weather and the battery had us at 94 and 86. 100% hydro is just the seasonal effect of our runner river hydros. Again, we have no dam and no storage. And so I'm going back to the slide here that shows what our seasonal looks like. As the snow started melting, as the temperatures start to warm in April, uh, more and more water is flowing through the rivers and we start to get into this typical April time frame where our hydros start producing um, more and more and more energy. Now, typically, as you can see on this graph here, we would have had to wait until we had enough excess hydro here to go 100% hydro and turn the diesels off. But now we have the batteries uh, and we don't have to have any of this excess available. So here we are back here in April, kind of more in this range, being able to go 100% hydro weeks before we would otherwise be able to. Great, thank you. All right, moving on. Um, someone asked, what was, in your opinion, the biggest challenge to commissioning this project? I'll speak first and uh, maybe uh, Scott has a, an opinion on this as well. Um, uh, I think our biggest challenge was uh, um, uh, communication, I will say. Communication uh, between people and communication between equipment. Um, we have a fairly highly automated SCADA system here and uh, that's a very, very highly automated um, piece of equipment. So to get the communication protocols correct, between our um, our control scheme and uh, ABB was uh, uh, there was a few uh, hiccups in there that we did not anticipate, um, and then the reason that there was a few hiccups there uh, was communication between people. Uh, we had many many calls and we had team meetings uh, uh, weekly, and um, even all the way at the end of that, I uh, feel like. Uh, our CEC's message and uh, our, uh, ABB and SAFT weren't perfectly aligned. They, th there was a few things that we told them once they got here on the ground. Okay, let's do this part of our project, and 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 the team, the uh, their field uh, techs said, wait, we don't do that, and we had to work through a couple of those. Um, so uh, that's what I would say. Uh, our most challenging part was um, was to get our um, the interface, the control interface between our SCADA system and uh, and their um, and the inverter working. Um, that being said, it's a, a fairly unique um, control interface, so there uh, the challenge was expected as well. Thanks. Did anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, this is Scott Newland. I'll add to that a little bit from my perspective. Well, one of the most important challenges or one of the most technical challenges was the communications. The day-to-day -day construction of this project was another challenge with the limited staff. So you have to take into perspective that we have a staff of three linemen and four generation operation people. And we put most of this project together in-house. So coordinating just the construction schedule and delivery schedule of parts and materials because we're flying everything in that we didn't get in the original bundle that we had there's a lot of there's a lot of parts that you need as you build a construction project like this that aren't uh, readily available so we had to coordinate all of that and coordinate our people with our day-to-day -day operations because we're still out there connecting people services, pulling meters, fixing engines, going to hydro projects and working on the equipment that breaks down, et cetera. 
So that, you know, that's the background issue of it is trying to coordinate a big project like this with limited people. And then at the same time, we have to coordinate with the vendors that come in, the ABBs and the SAFs and the technical people that we bring in, different, different uh, professions. And then we have to make time to have our, our employees work with them when they can be here because they can't be here for, for long periods of time. So we're trying to put this all together in a very short time frame. So, you know, that's one of the challenges. I'll just touch on what Nate said real quick. Uh, most of these installations are cookie cutter down on a national grid or a bigger grid. And when we came in and tried to integrate it into our own SCADA system, there were a lot of challenges with the communications that we weren't. I guess we didn't foresee that. We weren't looking for that. And it, it became a little bit of a roadblock, but we worked through it. Everybody that we worked with was very flexible and we appreciated that. And it just took a little bit more time than we thought it would. And that's my perspective of it. Okay, also for the Cordova team, I believe Clay, you mentioned you've gone around and done a lot of outreach and speaking about the Cordova project and trying to espouse the the benefits of energy storage on microgrid systems. Someone, actually, a couple of folks have asked if your procurement is available as a template or a copy of the specs that you used. Uh, yes, one of the uh, things that's really important um, to the Department of Energy, of course, is technology transfer and, and not just a project, but uh, making a technology available. So uh, we did borrow from uh, Sandia, had some stock templates, um, especially around the data uh, collection that we wanted to uh, characterize the performance. Uh, NRECA had some very good uh, stock template uh, procurement from many other cooperatives. We took those and we folded in some of our own requirements and concerns, and then uh, we did share those back, um, and, and we could certainly reshare those back to both NRECA, uh, the Business and Technology Strategy Group there, BTS they call it, and also to Sandia Labs, and we can certainly make those um, available through Dr. Juke to whomever he pleases. So. I think at this time, perhaps Dan, uh, Dan Borneo should say a few things because we have uh, stuff available on our website that he produced. Uh, yes, Emery. So we do, if you go to www.sandia.gov backslash ESS is as in energy storage system. You can just search on our RFP and there's a SAN document, Sandia document uh, going over that. And we are, the Sandians are available to uh, provide any answers to any questions you might have in um, doing your procurement documents. And we do this as a standard thing. When we have a project, uh, we help uh, the, uh, the people who put the project together in the procurement efforts as well. Terrific, great, thanks for jumping in there, Dan and Imre. All right, so we've reached 3.30 and we can conclude this webinar. I want to thank all the panelists for the great information and once again, congratulates Cordova on their successful project. The Clean Energy States Alliance does host regular webinars and you can go on our website to find out about upcoming webinars or they're right up on the screen right now. <laughs> and if you need to reach any of us, our information, our contact info is on the slide deck as well. Everyone will be receiving a link to this audio file and the slides in the next day or two. That's it, everyone. Thanks for joining and have a great day.